so i think uh, um, I, i used to think that uh, it is like an academic uh, house but now you you know how to um, you know enjoy entertainment also without sacrificing uh, academic uh, thing so thank you very much and uh, um um uh, we are grateful to you actually we are very much grateful to you um uh, you found time um, for our participants and uh, uh, thank you so much sir namaskar namaskar sir all the best to everyone thank you regards nice sir nice thank you uh now we have uh, uh, another uh, professor professor vanlal chona he is one of senior professors um, in mizoram university he is um, basically from economics department professor of economics uh, and uh, he has more than 3 decades of uh, teaching experience in college as well as uh, in the university in the university system and uh, he is also finance officer he is at the helm of uh, our university as finance officer and for last uh, more than last 5 years so this is his 6th year as finance officer and we all know um, in a central university finance officer plays a key role um, in management of uh, the university and uh, i know professor vanal chona not only um, as my colleague in our school i know him uh, for the last uh, um, uh, 17 to 18 years uh, as a humble human being and uh, uh, i know he did his phd in the area of uh, um, financing of higher education and now he is a practitioner as finance officer um, in a central university so actively he selected a topic on uh, financing of higher education that is very much uh, aptful topic and in in entire our uh, two week program i think no other resource person uh, has chosen this particular subject and being important stakeholders in higher education system and you and i need to learn certain um, financial aspects of higher education because uh, um uh, i mean um, that is one important uh, area and uh, being uh, stakeholders we need to learn about that so with this brief introduction um, i request uh, professor vanal chona um, i mean uh, uh, to start his session uh thank you professor joyti Yeah, uh, yes, for sir. giving me this opportunity to share you on uh, mm -hmm. one topic which is very much uh, related with uh, economics of education, and this is my topic would be financing of higher education in India, with reference to NEP twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, am I audible? And my yes, sir. Very, very much. Very good. Clear? Very good. Very good, sir. Okay. Okay. Now. Uh yeah screen, screen also we are able to see okay yeah now uh let me minimize now on the third introductory portion what i like to share with the uh participant is higher education is provided both by private and public sector we have several private university across the world including in india and even government uh, universities uh, have been found that means it is not purely public good public goods are goods which are uh, you cannot deny anybody uh, in the consumption of the particular commodity for instance national highway you cannot uh make somebody excluded from using that one but higher education is subject to uh your income your uh, degree okay even if you have money if you if you don't have any uh degree related for instance to go to the uh, bachelor degree you have to qualify for uh, 12 so it is not purely public good we can use exclusion principle okay we call it quasi public goods so higher education is quasi public goods that means it is uh provided both by private sector and public sector and 
there are certain uh, qualification to consume higher education. So it is not a kind of free public goods. Now, across the world, higher education or education in general consume a significant amount of public resources, which are measured usually in terms of as a percent of GDP and as a percentage of total expenditure. We shall highlight later on the level of expenditure in a country. Now, educational expenditure, whether it is elementary, secondary, or higher education, this is regarded as one of the most important components of investment in human being. Now, you, we might recall why USA is the topper in terms of economic development and uh, economic growth, why Japan is becoming a Japan uh, economy, South Korea, uh, Taiwan. All these are basically becoming one of the most successful and prosperous country in the world because of their high quality education right from primary elementary to uh, university education. Now, the basic broad driver of modern economy is investment in human beings. If we do not undertake uh, the right amount of investment in higher education or research and development, India can never be a prosperous country. So education is one of the critical component of modern investment. So a minimum level of educational provision is assumed to be necessary to attain a high degree of economic growth and development. This is the reality of our life. Unless and until we have some minimum level of educational investment, right amount of education, right infrastructure to our students, India can never become a prosperous country. India can never achieve the growth uh, projection that we are trying to achieve. And in terms of development, so all road construction and other uh, would be curtailed if we don't have the appropriate engineering, uh, engineering and main power structure that can undertake all this uh, latest development in technology. Okay, this is the introductory part. Now, one, one issue we talk about in public economic is why, why should the government intervene in a particular situation in the economy? And one reason is theoretically, whenever there is market failure, government should intervene in that market. For example, under pandemic situation, market economy fail to take any action against this COVID-19. So government must take decision. Government must invest in, in uh, vaccination. Government must invest, must incur a lot of expenditure in uh, preventive measures. So government intervention in any market is called for whenever there is market failure in that particular market. So similar situation happened in education market also. If education is provided only by profit motive, private enterprise. Many, many marginalized poor uh, people will be left out of educational uh, market, I, we should say. So there is clear market failure in educational market. That is why government intervention is required. These market failures are uh, this, we call it on equity aspect. So if private enterprise provide education right from elementary to university education, several marginal groups 
will be left out from educational uh, accessing educational facilities. So on equity to provide equal access to all people, regardless of caste, educational background, economic status, socioeconomic uh, affiliation. So on equity ground, there is uh, justification for government intervention in educational market. Then another is externality. There is positive and negative externality. Now, in terms of education, the positive externalities outweigh negative externality. Because this day, women education, women education is directly related with their fertility rate. During the 1970s and the 18s, direct intervention in family planning took place in India uh, on the basis of uh, planning agenda, on the basis of a planning commission agenda. They were forced in some occasion to sterilization, women, men, all this. But we don't have uh, the result, which is a desirable result. Now there is one thing that is related with women education and women fertility. The higher women education, the less is women fertility rate. So there is a negative relationship between women education and family size. This is the benefit, indirect benefit, what we call positive ex externality of uh, education. So, so many uh, externality benefits, which cannot be counted, which cannot be quantified in monetary terms. So it is always, we say, the direct benefit, the direct benefit in terms of my income outweighs my indirect benefit in terms of my better behavior, my being educated. I am now Kate place as a uh, citizen. You can become a member of your church, for instance, in Mizoram. You can be a good leader in NGO. So as educated, we have several uh, externalities that are utilized by the community. This is one reason why government intervene in the market. The private profit gained by the individual is very much less than the social benefit we gain from higher education or whatever level of education. So this is the idea. Another market failure in education market is capital market imperfection. Education market is highly imperfect. That means the future income is uncertain. No banker, unless you have a good security, will give any loans to any individual. Same is the future of any individual, regardless of their education, is very uncertain. Education investment uh, is uh, what you call a uh, required long gestation period. And whether in the age of uh, unemployment, whether the concerned student will really get any uh, good job in the market, whether he will be able to repay his loans. It is very uncertain. The future market for any individual in terms of employment is very, very uncertain, very risky. So that is why we cannot rely on, for instance, if you want to establish a good uh, car factory or any uh, factory relating to uh, any other things. So you simply cannot estimate the reality of the future. So it is unlike physical investment. Investment in human capital is not comparable to investment in 
physical uh, asset. Then, sir, are, are you moving uh, the slides? Sir? Are you trying to move the? Uh, we are we are able to see only the first slide. Huh? Uh, what do we? We are, we are able to see only only the first slide. Um, um, uh, that is why uh, you, uh, you are Any not problem? able to. You are not able to move these slides. Next slide. No, no, no. I'm still explaining this slide. First, first only. Okay, okay, okay. Then okay. Please carry okay. on. Yeah. So carry I am on. explaining equity. Okay. I am explaining externality. Yes, 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 yes. I am explaining market imperfection. Now I am coming to information asymmetry. Wonderful, okay. wonderful, wonderful. Yes, yeah. yes. So <laughs> don't be in a hurry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. We are I, am, I was to... thinking there may be some technical problem in uh, movement oh, of... Oh, uh, okay, don't okay. I see, I see. Okay, okay. So now, please, please continue. the fourth reason why there is market failure in educational market is market, I mean, the market information in educational uh, sector is highly imperfect. There are a lot of cheating. There are a lot of... Uh, um, advertisement okay one party has more of better information the others teachers are cheating their student teachers are not performing but the student might not know so uh, a poorly delivered lectures sometime due to peer ignorance may not be able to judge assess by the student whether the teacher is performing well or not or at the management level also the management may try to cheat, the teachers may try to provide wrong information. So these kind of issues are there. That is why government intervention in educational market is very important. That is why I want all the uh, participants to clearly understand we need to give an assessment whether private university is better than public university, whether the so many uh, so-called A grade or world ranking university are actually doing their job for the people. So we need to wait on the basis of economic hard facts. What will happen to the poor and marginalized? What will happen if only the rich and the well of society have access to education. Okay, all these need to be considered when evaluating private university versus public uh, university. This is one of the starting point of the uh, arguments. Now, criteria of educational financing. One criteria is adequacy of the funding. Whether that is really enough enough fund is there, whether the level of provision of educational services is adequate. So during 1960 and uh, mid-1970, 8% uh, of GDP or GNP was deemed adequate. And in most urban countries, sharing central budget uh, may be sufficient if at least 20% of the budgetary resources are uh, uh, appropriated for educational sector. Uh, in, during the late 1970, World Bank suggested uh, certain yardstick to assess the availability of fund. These are uh, the proportion of the relevant age group enrolled in primary school. How much should we invest in primary school should be determined on the basis of the proportion of the relevant age group enrolled in primary school. Another criteria that is very popular with the World Bank people, World Bank policymakers are proportion of female enrolled in primary school. Another is proportion of age cohort enrolled in secondary education. Then adult literacy rate. So while considering the criteria of educational financing, the concern, authority must initiate uh, this kind of uh, criteria, okay? It should not be a, a kind of blind allocation. 
there should be some rationality behind all educational resource allocation. This is what Beng is suggesting. Now coming to the next slide. Another criteria is efficiency. Whether the distribution of educational resources is efficient. Another criteria is, uh, mean uh, this efficiency of investment in criteria can be judged on the basis of cost benefit ratio. The idea of cost benefit ratio is very simple. Reduce the cost while holding output constant. The idea is, can I? Sir, uh, next, next slide, sir. We are not able to see the next slide. Go to the next slide. Huh? You cannot yeah. see the slide. Uh, next slide, uh, not moving. Mm. Is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, share is pause. Bring your share window to the front. What does that mean? I am not having any issue yet. Is it going? Is it going? Uh, no, 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 not it, not it. Ah, then uh, what to do? Power supply, I mean, internet is not properly working here. It may not be, it may not be the net problem, some technology. Mm. So yeah, you are there, what to do? Shriya, HRTC, anyone, anyone is there? Sir, you close and again you open, sir, then it may burst. <laughs> you you okay. close the entire thing Let and me. you open. Now resuming. Stop sharing, okay? Stop sharing and again start sharing. Okay. Uh, let me start. Okay. Yeah, now, okay? now criteria of educational financing, it came. Is it okay? Uh, is it okay is, now? Is it moving? Fine. Yeah, yes, yes, sir, yes. Sir. yes. Okay, okay. This <laughs> is the uh, ongoing uh, slide, okay? Yes, yes, yeah. To judge Please. efficiency of educational sector investment, there are two uh, usually approach uh, used by public policymaker, cost benefit ratio, okay? The same number of uh, students could be taught at a lower cost or not. This is the idea. Then cost effectiveness, effectiveness is yield of educational output relative to the consumption of real resources by educational. So cost effectiveness is judged in terms of weightages in education, repetition, failure rate. Okay, these are the important criteria used. Uh, in judging the cost effectiveness of educational sector. So normally we can use cost benefit ratio. You will collect. Uh, and this cost benefit ratio is also a little bit technical. The benefit part is very, very difficult to collect information because here you need age, earning profile need to be constructed. Anyhow, there are some attempts to understand the cost benefit ratio to understand the rate of profit at the primary level, secondary level, and higher educational level. Now coming to the traditional criteria, this is uh, a kind of uh, what we have talked about equity, whether the distribution of educational resources is equitable. Now, the idea I can give you is, the cost of education per student is much more expensive in higher education compared to school education, okay? But in terms of social returns, in terms of social benefit, uh, higher uh, education is less profitable, I should say, than uh, educational, I mean, uh, school education. In terms of the advantage derived, uh, education at the school level is much more beneficial to the society. This is the idea uh, of equity. 
and primary and secondary education fund, uh, fund flow from centers to state government, uh, whether funds are properly utilized by the uh, school. And in many areas across the country, especially in Northern Indian, school funds are not utilized properly. Uh, this is some of the findings, several findings, Amartya Sen and his teams are doing a lot of uh, research on this issue. Now, these are uh, inversely the fundability of the school education expansion of new program is also related with the fiscal capacity of the concerned government. Now we are lucky central government has initiated a lot of central sector scheme like rusa uh, ssa uh, like that so state government are relief uh, because of this uh, fiscal intervention in the educational uh, sector which are we see is the responsibility of state government now Grants is another mechanism given uh, to higher and post-secondary education. And this is actually India is copying, India is imitating Europe and other developing countries. And in USA, grants and loans are given to the students. And uh, each university or each state has its own structure and uh, methodology to assess uh, the worthiness of fund grants or loans to the students. Now, in India, uh, sources of educational financing, finance, uh, in India, higher education is regarded as merit ones. We don't, we don't take higher education as public uh, goods. You know, in Nordic country, Denmark, Sweden, and other country, it, higher education is regarded as uh, public goods, not merit ones. Uh, it is so totally financed by the, uh, in Nordic country, it is totally financed by uh, the state. But in India, it's not like that. It is a mixed financing. This is our common features in many of the uh, non-communist country. The state as well as private sector invests in education. And in the context of India, central government funded many of the uh, national level, uh, nationally regarded uh, higher institution, very, which are essential for uh, the country as a whole. We have this IIM, IIT, NIT, AIMS, and others. These are uh, directly funded by government. And as we have already mentioned, government initiated several centrally sponsored scheme to support state government. And state government out of its own budgetary allocation that is uh, from taxpayers' money, they are now providing higher education. And at the local bodies, local bodies are not involved in financing higher education. They are only at the panchayat municipality level that uh, they are financing school education. Normally, this municipality, panchayats, Jila uh, Parishad are concerned about school education. State government, main concern in several states is uh, college education and higher education. Central government uh, is giving top uh, institutions as its priority. Now we have some non-government sources also. These are students, parents, or families. Two fees and other maintenance expenditure. Same is happened to here. In our own university, 95% uh, of our finances come from UGC and students 
or this uh, student fee, uh, user charges, uh, and other uh, related contribution uh, form only 5% of our resources. Now, several countries, they have uh, these philanthropists uh, who donated lots of money uh, in their uh, endowments or just simply straight away donate to the university uh, for those who need fee subsidy. This is what is at the pandemic moment also, several writers, several uh, education uh, experts are suggesting that this is the time community, especially the billionaires, millionaires, and those who have resources, this is the time to donate for education. Now, if you look at the latest, uh, Uh, some of the meetings at the highest level uh, at the international, several people are raising this kind of concern. Now, some of the main features now we will be talking. Uh, how long should I go? Uh, up to 12.30, uh, Pujoiti? Uh, actually, your session is up to one o'clock. It's up to you. Uh, I mean, um... You are free to go up to one o'clock also, no problem. But last 15 minutes, uh, better we have some interaction. There may be some questions. Uh, okay, I'll try up to 12.30, okay? Yeah, no, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, coming to the features of educational finances in India, we have seen the dominance of state finances, the share of government, central and state. It has increased significantly over the years. Now, uh, central government and state government, uh, instead of uh, providing uh, more uh, university by state government or central government, they are creating uh, environment whereby uh, even uh, private uh, university, highly technical one, could manage themselves. So the policy perspective has been change, changing. Uh, this is what happened across the country. Every day, new university are created in the uh, private sector. All institutions of higher education rely extensively on public funds, as we have already uh, stated. A central university like Mizoram University, we rely exclusively to say, I should say, uh, uh, on public funds. The law of ever increasing state activity apply. So uh, this is what happened. Now state government meets more than half of the total expenditure on education and central government meets hardly one fifth of, one -fifth of the total expenditure of the con uh, in the country. This is the reality we are facing. And uh, this is why we have been seeing uh, a number of uh, school buildings uh, are not uh, properly equipped with uh, the right infrastructure facilities. So as we have already mentioned, central government has increased its intervention via the central sector scheme like RUSA, SSA, like that. These are the mechanism uh, which the state are utilizing uh, as I, we observe in our own state in Mizoram also. Many new schools are built because of the program under uh, SSA. And at the college level also, RUSA, has done a lot to improve infrastructural, higher educational infrastructure in the state, in spite of uh, the fact that only one fifth of the uh, share is uh, contributed by the central government. 
Now, as we have already said, local bodies are restricted to school education only. Now, the sale of non-governmental sources, fees and others have declined over the years. This is the reality. In many central university for almost 30 years, uh, actually after their existence, they have never raised a single, I uh, mean, the, they, they don't dare to raise fees uh, because of fear of repercussions from the student community. They never revise upward uh, their fees. This is what happened uh, in the country. There are several factors affecting the rapid growth of public financing of higher education in India. Number one is inadequate facilities at the time of independence. Uh, I don't need to explain much. Social demand for higher education, particularly politically motivated and partly genuine. I think we understand some political parties uh, uh, offer themselves to the public. If he or she is elected, she will give this school, that school, colleges like that, that kind of political commitment, politically motivated kind of uh, things are happening in the country. And because of the real need of society also, real social demand are emerging. Uh, in the country. So the demand for higher education is uh, now increasing. Yes, politically correct decision is to provide more and more better facilities to higher education. And it is the public uh, who need, who utilize that resources, as we have mentioned, until and unless the, our educational needs are satisfied. India could never have a consistently growing economy unless our main power are equipped with the right skill, which are relevant in the modern technology driven world. We will never compete with other countries. We will never uh, get any productivity enhancing uh, activities. So large scale skill manpower requirement under plan has also increased. And this day, skill development is now a part of government policy. Government policy towards equality in educational opportunity leading to massive investment in higher education. So uh, education, primary uh, uh, education, is now one of the basic rights. So everybody uh, must attend school education. So there is a push factor from below after this right to education uh, act was passed. Now the rapid growth of primary and secondary education naturally push the demand for higher education. So rapid population growth push the demand for primary and secondary education and increase in rapid growth in primary and secondary education naturally puts the demand for higher education. Now, limitation of public financing of higher education in India, social rate of return to higher education, though very high, is less than private rate of returns to education. This is empirical evidence. There is an increasing share of uh, private funding uh, called for from efficiency point of view. Okay, social rate of return to higher education, though high, is less than private rate of return to education. Those who qualify for IIM, IIT, AIMS, and other get private uh, benefits. Meanwhile, as a whole, in spite of heavy investment in higher education, in medical engineering management, the social rate of return is much less compared to those individual rate of return. This is the idea. 
majority of students are from relatively economically better off families. That means these top uh, colleges are mostly enjoyed by the econ economically better off families. This is the reality we are having at the moment. Since indirect taxes are the main sources of government revenue, 15%, only 15% is generated from direct taxes. Financing of higher education out of general tax revenue means in effect, transform, transfer of resources from the poor to the rich. Okay, so only the rich study in higher education, but that higher education is funded by indirect taxes. Then that kind of situation make a regressive. So regressive educational financing situation has developed in the country at the expense of the poor higher education are running where only the economically better off families could study. So now the reality that has come to the public is to what extent higher education should be subsidized at the expense of elementary education? This is an important question in the financing of higher education. Now, since 1990, state funding to education in general and higher education in particular has been declining, okay? Private institution, particularly in areas of management, engineering, medicine, computers, etc., have been coming up in large numbers, raising issues of access, equity, quality, and regulation. And now foreign educational institutions are coming, making the system more complex. Now, what is happening at the moment is internationalization of higher education, privatization of higher education, and at the same time, massification of higher education in the country because of uh, the push, push factor, uh, which is caused by population increase and the uh, secondary school leavers are also increasing after uh, this uh, right to education. All these factors has uh, a multi uh, huge impact on higher education situation. Now, what we are witnessing is internationalization of higher education. And this is one issue uh, suggested by NEP 2020 also. Now, privatization of higher education is going on in a big way. And at the same time, so state funding is gradually declining. This is the reality we are facing at the moment. And some of the facts and figure, let me try to quote, real growth rate on higher education falling. It was 7.5% in 1950, 11% in 1960, 3.4% in 1970s, a bit improved to 7.3% in 1980, and 5.4% in 1990. Now, per student expenditure in constant terms declined by minus 1.5% during the 90s. The proportion of scholarship in the public expenditure of states on higher education declined consistently over the 1990s. So actually that 1990s is one important benchmark in Indian economy because of that big crisis we had. And right from 1990 onwards, liberalization process going on. And here, a uh, policymaker has a second look at the financing of higher education in the country. And NIPFP also published a study on this finance uh, subsidy, uh, subsidy in higher education way back in the 1990s. 
The share of central government has remained around 20% since 1990. Much of the central government funds are rooted, especially in context of higher education, UGC, the bulk, the bulk of the financing going to central university. Now, this is the current situation, composition of, uh, oh, sorry, I'm still using MHRD. It should be Ministry of Education budget by department. At that particular point, it was still MHRD. Now, the blue one is the percentage shares of school education. The red one is the share of higher education. Yeah, during this two, two, 2012 to 2017, the, during this very short period of time also, you could easily see how the trend in financing, public financing of higher education is uh, going. The share of school education is falling. You see from 69% to 58%. Over this short period, we see a 10 percentage point decline in the share of school education. Now, the share of uh, school education is, uh, I mean, uh, higher education, the red one is slowly increasing from 31 to uh, 42%. So this is, so uh, growth in uh, higher educational expenditure is uh, happening in the country at the expense of uh, school education resources. This is what we can observe from this figure. So as financing the share of higher education is increasing, we see and witness a decline in the share of uh, school education. This is the trend. This trend is still going on. Now, some of the proposition, recommendation made by Education uh, Commission, this uh, Kothari Commission was suggesting 6% of GNP to education must be allocated. Oh, by 1986, still now, this is an elusive dream to achieve this one. The share of GNP given to education grew from a very low level of below 1% 1 in 1951-52 and reached all the time high of 4.4% uh, in 2000 and 2001, and then sharply declined again to 3.54% in uh, 2004 and 2005. Uh, another uh, important uh, committee, CABE 2005, recommended elementary education at least 3% of GNP should be devoted and 1.5% in secondary uh, education and 1.5% in higher and technical education. This is the suggestion made by uh, Central Advisory Board of Education back in 2005. Now, share of GNP by higher education in 1990 was just 0 0.046. And it fell sharply to 0 0.34% uh, in 2004 and 5. Now, as a percentage, you can easily see 1991, 92, it was 0 0.067. Can you see? And by 2004, and so the all time high is 4.4 in 2000 and 2001. 2004, it has been going down again. Now the new trend I will show you. This is the new trend that we have been seeing. And the green one is state plus center share. So it is now uh, stabilizing at around 4%. This is what we are witnessing at the, uh, what the data tell us. Uh, this is actually not uh, higher education, it is education, all education, okay? Uh, I made a mistake here. You take it as education as such. 
now not higher education now coming to how to mobilize resources for higher education there are several uh, mechanism that has been tried after uh, uh, some time pass earmark tax graduate tax this has been never realized and educational tax educational says has been collected to finance SSA and RUSA. You might be uh, remembering whenever you pay your uh, BSNL telephone, educational says sometime in the past, it was all well, always included under mobilization of resources from non-government sources, as we have already uh, mentioned, to privatization of higher education is a part of resource mobilization uh, from the uh, private sector and recovery of full cost of education from users, public provision with contribution from private sector, private provision of education with public financing. Now, several innovative mechanisms have been tried in the Western countries, but in India, we don't have uh, any scope for that kind of exercise because of the uh, situation, economic situation, we are having no innovative uh, educational funding from private sector. Non-government sources is very difficult uh, to derive at the moment. Now, the graduate taxes, we have already said, uh, there are justification for that. In spite of that, it is very difficult to uh, implement a graduate tax is an education specific tax to be levied from those who use the educated manpower. Rational uh, employers should save the cost of the production of high skilled manpower. So it's uh, between the employer and the tax authority. Interest on physical capital, so it's interest on human capital. Same thing, uh, the idea is when we use physical capital like money, you borrow money to purchase uh, machine, you are paying interest. So human capital also uh, be charged interest uh, by the user of that particular skill, that human capital, okay? This, in this incentive to employer substitution of cheaper graduates. So theoretically, there are a lot of argument uh, supporting and, and against that particular idea. Education says 3% of service tax, mobiles, higher education says 1% from landline. These are uh, some of those who we used to experience sometimes past. Now it has been done away. And private finances for higher education, household expenditure, I mean, Household invest substantially on higher education, almost equivalent to institutional cost. Parents paid a lot of money for education of our children. Fee, stationary, personal maintenance, exercise. This is also a part of the private finances. Fees are declining despite increasing income. Then capitation fee is also not recommended in the context of certain kind of exploitative situation that is developing. Uh, discriminatory fees suggested cost of tuition on family income being the criteria, the rich may be charged higher fee and uh, who are uh, poverty, below poverty line family may be fully exempted. So discriminatory fee are also suggested, but they are very difficult to operate. And student loan is now emerging an important source of private financing and voluntary contribution are also there. Many uh, corporate houses in some cases uh, are providing kind of fee relief to poor students and others. Now, student loan, interest-free national loan scholarship was introduced in 1963 and yeah, 20,000 loan scholarships have been awarded every year. Um, these are some of the expenditure compared to what? Now, uh, we, we don't have any clear idea about how much is uh, this nationalized banks are giving educational loans.
to the students. We don't have any idea, but these are some of the uh, data that we can obtain in regard to these things. Uh, uh, bank waste, we may, it may be available, but today I'm not, uh, I cannot give you all the relevant information. And one of the, as we have said, the credit market for education alone in India is highly imperfect. Okay, this is highly imperfect. And the poor does not have any access at all to this credit market for education alone. If your parents or my parents happen to be a professor or very rich or very wealthy, then I can take loan on the basis of my father's uh, security. This is what happened here. Now, coming to NEP 2020, I'll rush with it. By 2030, all higher educational institution will become multidisciplinary institution. And by 2040, only three types of university will be visible in the country. Research intensive university. Number two is teaching intensive industries. I mean, uh, higher education, then autonomous degree granting college. Only three types of university will be functioning in the country after 2040. This is one of the uh, suggestion policy uh, measures suggested by NEP 2020. Affiliated colleges will be phased out by 2035 to a system of graded autonomy. And by 2040, they must become autonomous degree granting college, or they could become a constrained college under universities. Now, all single stream, for instance, arts college only, law college only, uh, engineering college only, all standalone institution will be phased out by 2040. And they must become a multidisciplinary institution. Now, accreditation system will be an integral part of higher education institution under this NEP. Now, degree program becomes three or four duration with multiple exit options and appropriate certification, certificate after one year, including vocational and professional areas, diploma after two years and bachelor degree after three years and four years is with research or owner degree. Another important landmark we are going to experience is an academic bank of credit. Degree earned from various recognized uh, higher educational institution will be digitally stored. A two-year master program with second year devoted to research for four-year bachelor holder, one-year master program, five-year integrated bachelor master program may also be feasible. Now here, there are a lot of issues that we have to consider before opting this kind of um, structure because additional one year mean additional responsibility for the institution. That means uh, we need to create additional capacity, additional room or additional teachers, additional library, additional uh, mean laboratory equipments. So it is not simply kind of transition to a four-year degree course from T2. Additional capacity need to be created. This is the real challenge. Or now another idea, vocationalization has been uh, emphasized very much, but who will teach this vocational uh, studies? You are, if the student opted for uh, a highly technical paper, then if that is not available, if teaching, if teachers are not available, what will happen to the student concern? So there are many areas where we need to define the direction we are planning to go ahead with uh, this kind of uh, NEP 20 policy measures. Now, moving away from 
high stake examination towards more continuous and comprehensive evaluation. This is a very good suggestion. By 2030, all standalone teacher education institution will be converted into multidisciplinary institution, offering the four-year integrated teacher education, giving dual degree in major BA as well as other subject. BA, BA, they can provide now uh, simultaneously part of mainstream education. This is one of the unique features of the national, the new education policy. National education policy 2020 is very determined to introduce vocational education. By 2025, at least 50% of learners would have exposure to uh, vocational education. And the regulatory framework also will be totally restructured. New regulatory higher education commission HESI will be started. This will, the us and EMRA, uh, there are four umbrella organization, uh, National Higher Education Regulatory Council, National Accreditation Council, Higher Education Grants Council, and General Education Council. GEC will formulate National Higher Educational Qualification Framework. Now, the uh, draft one is already available. Uh, set facilitative norms for issues such as credit transfer equivalence and data trust. Now, the point is, well, this agency regulatory institution are not yet constructed. The government of India is pushing like anything to implement NEP 2020. Now, for me, it is like trying to go in the dark, in the absence of all this regulatory kind of um, organization. We cannot move forward. It is very difficult. Now, even vocational education also, the policy suggested to work with uh, sector skill council. Now sector skill council is not yet ready to work with this kind of college courses. They have their own structure right now. So we, they need to modify themselves also. So we need uh, a long time to go to really implement educational, this national education policy 2020. Now the, there is one commitment in regard to financing of higher education. The NEP committed to raise educational investment to 6% of GDP, it observed there is no better investment towards a society's future than the high quality education of our young people, okay? Education policy 1968, the first one, this is after Kothari Commission 1966, this is the first one. Then a new one comes 1986 at the time of Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. Then this was modified in 1992. All this policy document recommended 6% of GDP. This magic figure could never reach in India, I don't know. Now, uh, presently, center and state expenditure on education has been around 4.3% of GDP and accounted for 10% of total government expenditure. Now, the long-term trust areas of, for financing of education as formulated by NEP 2020 is early childhood care education, foundational literacy and numeracy, school complex, school clusters, food and nutrition, teacher education, and continuing professional development of teachers, revamping colleges and university to foster excellence, cultivating research, extensive of technology and online education. This is the trust area for financing of education. Then uh, the concern agency must be able to develop fundable scheme and project in this area. This is the real challenge faced by our educational administrator at the center and the state. Now, the policy document stated that both central and state government will work together. Both central and state government will work together 
to increase the public investment in education sector to reach 6% of GDP. Now, most Indian states are expecting to increase central government, their support to education sector. Now, the document said both central and state government will work together to increase public investment. So it is now the joint responsibility of central and state government to read this uh, magic figure of 6% of GDP. Here, financial support will be provided to various critical elements and component of education, such as ensuring universal access, learning resources, nutritional. So what they are suggesting, uh, these are the, some of the suggestions that we have already outlined. Now, Another uh, observation made by NEP 2020 is very pertinent issue. The need is to increase efficiency in use of available budget by suitable policy changes. So whatever limited resources are available for education, the efficiency we have to increase, improve uh, the efficiency. This is very challenging. Financial governance and management will focus on the smooth, timely, and appropriate flow of funds. Okay, governance and management, these are critical issues. These are very challenging for all uh, central government organizations, including central university, state university, uh, colleges, and school, even at the school level also. Now, the provision of uh, general financial rule PFMS and just in time release to implementing agency will be followed by for efficient use of government resources and avoiding parking of funds. So these are some of the issue that government is already implementing uh, to different different mechanism. The mechanism of performance based funding to state higher education it may be devised. Similarly, efficient mechanism will be ensured for the optimal allocation and utilization of uh, this fund earmark for SEDG groups. Okay, these are some of the major uh, team I can share with you today. Uh, so, so any any question or any uh, only one if possible can we go on next slide uh, okay nothing is there uh, so now Puzoiti, your turn yes uh, thank you very much sir and, uh, this is power failure in my place and uh, miss mane will uh, <coughs> miss mane will participant and she will take over and really wonderful uh, um, presentation because this is very much relevant to every one of us being main stakeholders in higher education system and uh, being an economist and uh, as well as being a practicing finance uh, officer um, you touched upon many aspects of uh, higher education system um, and the government's role also we have touched upon and uh, um, public good and uh, um, so main main issue is uh, uh, government governments want to um, escape from their responsibility of financing education, not primary and um, secondary. Then, uh, oh, your voice is clear. So, um, uh, Ms. Mana, you please take over. Yes, 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 yes. Please take over. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you so much uh, to uh, Professor Baratson and our effort. And sir, um, thank you for your time. And there is only one question in that question and answer box. And so uh, if you could please uh, answer this one or uh, like at least your observation like that. Uh, the question is, is civil score required for higher education loan? That is from Paramana Sivan. I, I don't have much idea on educational loan uh, this day, okay. because I am only concentrating on public financing this day. I don't have any much experience to share with you on educational loan. 
uh, how the market is exp is managed. I have no idea. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, sir. Yeah. Yeah, regarding Sibyl, Sibyl is a little bit different. Yeah, uh, there may be some effect here. Anyway, uh, sir, um, regarding introducing this NEP, uh, even in the university and education, uh, in the education system, like UG or PG, and then how do you think that uh, this uh, policy, is it uh, uh, like what to say? Mm, will it be better than the previous one? How do you observe? I just want to know your opinion. Regarding? Uh, this NEP, NEP yeah, new education policy, yeah. Oh. How do, uh, what this, is your opinion? This is a good policy document, but it requires commitment on the part of mm -hmm. government of India to really implement. Okay, uh, all the and so uh, without any commitment to uh, funding, uh, yes. it would not really work out. That is my point. Maybe. So Maybe. the thing very little is written about how funding will be committed to the uh, educational sector development in the country. Mm -hmm. We all know our education system is. Uh, on the brink of collapse, especially mm. our uh, primary education, secondary education in many rural areas, they are not performing. Okay, and only few uh, nationally uh, recognized institutes on NIT, IIT, IIM, and some other uh, institution, they are given fund as per their requirement, but many central universities are not getting enough fund to uh, improve their infrastructure facilities. So the real needs of the institution must be examined. And after that, the central uh, government in the educational authority should get the real information that is needed. It is not simply writing some mm. of their imaginative thoughts on how best to run educational institution. Yes. There must be a touch of reality, mm. how the country educational system is working. Okay, mm. what exactly is the requirement in terms of teachers qualification, in terms mm. of financial support, okay? Mm. All these are not yet properly estimated. So from the point of view of financing, there is no clarity of uh, program as to how uh, all the uh, new scheme will be funded. Okay, Vocational education, this is not a simple thing. Require lots of inputs, okay? Imagine we are running one uh, here, Hanlu in MZU. It requires a lot of support from UGC just to run a simple hand loop, I should say. Mm -hmm. How much money is required? How can colleges and in the country will run, will introduce vocational education without mm -hmm. providing facilities, without yes. providing additional manpower? Mm -hmm. this is, I don't know how it could do. Yes, uh, we have. Yeah, we have a few experience from our department also, yeah, uh, regarding work and responsibility as well. So it's quite difficult sometimes to manage. Anyway, uh, sir, one more question is there. Uh, that is about why funding from uh, the state government, uh, why funding yes. from the state government funding very low for colleges and another, I think that is the same thing. Why funding is, is, is very low for state government colleges. Actually, think, state government don't have enough resources to fund colleges. And in several uh, part of the countries, especially in the South, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, several of them of these affiliated college are run by trust and private society. So they just uh, 
uh, don't provide enough, uh, mean the, these private sector agencies are not running their educational institution properly. And in the under, in the under days, more than 85% of these are private. So they don't have fun at all. And in several states where most of the colleges are government colleges, and they don't have in Assam and Mizoram, in Northeast India, most of our colleges are uh, publicly funded if they are not fully uh, provincialized. But they don't have enough fund, as we say. College and education require a lot of money. And they don't employ, you see, not uh, as per UGC stipulation. They are engaging guest faculty, contract teachers, uh, this and that. So okay. security of tenure is not guaranteed in several uh, higher education. So it is more or less like a, a poorly funded private primary school. They are running like that. So state government, even if they want, there is no incentive for uh, running, for providing fund to the state because the system is already in a bad shape and just putting more money at this point of time we don't, will not help improve the situation because at the state level, many of the colleges are the responsibility of the state government. They, the state government themselves also need a relook at the situation in the country. And simply the NEP 2020 suggested Affiliated colleges will be phased out by 2035, and they should become multi-disciplinary uh, institution 2040. Will that really happen? What are the guidelines? What are the uh, yardstick they are going to use? Who is going to give them? If you are working, for instance, in a college, who will give you the guidance to reach that particular stage? There are a lot of... Uh, questions to be answered in this respect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like a dream. Yeah, it may be just like a dream. So <laughs> yeah, anyway, sir. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the Department of uh, the Commerce and all the organizing team, uh, thank you so much for sparing your valuable time for uh, this session and we all the participants, we are, I hope we find it very, uh, very interesting and it's very informative. Even some of you drop a comment uh, that it's a very informative and we are very happy to you, sir. So um, I think there will be uh, yes. uh, no other Thank question. you. Thank you. So, so <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. You, you may leave, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I think it's about to, it's almost uh, one, uh, one. Uh, we used to have a lunch break uh, from one to between one to one thirty. So as uh, we uh, end up a little bit earlier than the other day, I think we can have a uh, lunch time. And so uh, is there still, sir, uh, Professor uh, Arhe, 